All right, so good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Readings in Contemporary Poetry series. Um, my name is Megan Whitco, and I'm an assistant curator here at DIA, and it's my great pleasure to welcome everyone to tonight's reading. I'm particularly pleased to welcome our two poets for this evening. Uh, we have Keith and Rosemary Waldrop. Uh, thank you both for generously agreeing to join us tonight and also for traveling to, to be here tonight. We're very glad to have you. Um, I also want to extend a very heartfelt thanks to Dominique Levy Gallery uh, because they provide major support for the Readings in Contemporary Poetry series. Uh, we also have additional support provided by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs as well as our media sponsor, the Brooklyn Rail. And we also want to thank Brooklyn Brewery, who provides complimentary cold beverages for the evening as well. And lastly, I am very appreciative of the assistance from all of Dia's staff, who helped coordinate this series, particularly Francesca, Max, Maria, Mary Catherine, Julian, and Emma. So as this is our final reading for this season, I hope that a lot of you are gonna join us again in the fall when we resume. And I wanna let you know that the dates and the names for the fall program should be available uh, on Dia's website in mid to late June. So I hope you'll be checking back then. And if for some reason you would like to be on Dia's mailing list and you're not already, there is a sheet out front where you're welcome to add your name. Uh, we would love to have you. So just a quick schedule of events. So following the first reader, we'll take a brief 10 minute intermission. Um, feel free to grab another beverage or purchase uh, book title will have uh, books by both poets for sale out there during intermission. And then we'll resume with the second reader for the evening. So it's now my great pleasure to give a warm welcome to Vincent Katz, who's going to introduce our uh, first reader of the evening. Thank you. Thank you, Megan, and thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, yeah, it's really an exciting evening, and I can't think of a better way to conclude this season of readings in contemporary poetry than with Rosemary and Keith Waldrop as um, writers, translators, publishers, editors, teachers, and human beings. Uh, I think that they've really been exemplary in what used to be called a life in letters. You don't really hear that term much anymore, but I feel like it's something to aspire to, and they've definitely been models for that. Um, they've done a lot together, so I thought I would like to highlight that before I actually introduce Rosemarie. And as Megan mentioned, this is kind of also the occasion, or an occasion, um, to celebrate the publication simultaneously of their selected poems. Keith has selected poems and Rosemary has selected poems that are just out and they're available here. So um, they both have terrific covers by Keith. So check them out. And um, yeah, so they have done a number of works in collaboration. They've, they've composed uh, collaboratively and published um, a collection called Well, Well Reality. Their autobiographies, Ceci n'est pas Keith, Ceci n'est pas Rosemary, a translation of Jacques Roubaud's poems about the streets of Paris, and among others, the Abacadarian work, Flat with No Key. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't mention, again, exemplary first journal and continuing until today, their press, Burning Deck, Press, which was um, started in the early 1960s. And now I will introduce Rosemary Waldrop, who will read first. Rosemary Waldrop was born in Kitzingen, Germany, in 1935. Her recent books include Love Like Pronouns, Blind Sight, Curves to the Apple, and Driven to Abstraction. Gap Gardening Selected Poems is just out from New Directions Press. Her collection of essays, Dissonance, if you are interested, was published by University of Alabama Press in 2005. 
She has translated 14 volumes of Edmond Jabez's work, as well as work by other experimental French and German authors. In 1993, she was awarded the Harold Morton Landon Translation Award for her translation of Jabez's The Book of Margins, and was named Chevalier des Arts et des Lettres by the French government. She lives in Providence. I wanted to be a poet, writes Rosemary Waldrop, but thought it was not possible after I came to the US and lost my language. It followed, I thought, that the way I could work with poetry would be translating into German and teaching. It was only gradually that I mustered the courage to attempt poems in English and to translate into English. It came with the realization that the discrepancies between my two languages need not be an obstacle but could, on the contrary, become a generative force. <laughs> Reading through Rosemary Waldrop's selected poems, one finds waves of poetry and prose interceding, making incursions, then giving way, enabling diverse forms of writing. Her early poems are notable for their acceptance of the mundanity of things and of language. In a long sequence titled, As If We Didn't Have to Talk, published in 1972, she writes, the way this city plays with our bodies, so much rain, the smell of wet cement stays in the streets, out of the old shell, we're always walking in a crowd. By the time of Split Infinites, published in 1998, repetitions have taken on a life of their own so that Prepositions and conjunctions assume a dominant role in determining the music's, sorry, excuse me, in determining the poem's musicality. Finally, history and memoir are embedded in mellifluous text that is kept as fresh as something just seen or tasted. One gets the sensation, reading her later pieces, that uncannily, everything is connected. Quote, let us therefore use a little nubile and strong, bewildered carnivore, and that from childhood, mother in a pose of annihilation, sexual autonomy. Does it occur? CF philosophical investigations to the ends of the earth. And we should follow Rosemary to the ends of the earth if necessary, which I doubt. Here she is tonight. Please welcome Rosemary Waldrop. Thank you so much, Vincent. This was wonderful. And thank you all for coming. This is, it's a real celebration for Keith and me to see you all and get to say hello. And well, as Vincent said, also, also thank, thank you, Megan, for arranging everything. Um, since this is a celebration of the selected poems, I thought I would read something from beginning, middle, and end. And so it starts with um, a sequence from my first book that actually Vincent just already quoted from, and uh, which is from 1972, which really boggles the mind how long it is ago. <laughs> So these are a few poems from As If We Didn't Have to Talk. I want to stay and look at the mess I've made, spills over context. I'm always on the verge of seeing it there on the horizon. With doubt in the foreground, anything may, hence the troubled periphery. The curves lost, incomplete, incompletable. Wind over the plains, abandoned streets, general amnesia, the vacant breath of sky. Breath of sky. I might as well claim it's a rag to wipe my hands. But as long as we're... It doesn't matter, in spite of constant variations, what we say. My memory open, you are there, 
scenes I hardly, I'd, I'd hardly been aware of, our faces touching give way to slaughter of a surprised beast. My body vast, unsure territories. It would take a long, I mean images, what they mean to me gets lost. Vibrations, distant heat, it would take a long walk through mounting sand to reach them. I'm sure I've never known anything in any language. The air swollen, moisture, spider webs, mildewed shadow. If only I could feel real drops against my lips, spills over the edges. A woman leans out of the window as if there were anything to see. A hundred yards off, cars race and a jackhammer tears. Not even my feet can hear it. You are walking somewhere toward me. And in a while we'll, as if things could be touched, teeth against tongue, as if we didn't have to talk. The belly of an eye and vertigo throws the words I stand on into the white silence charged with all the possible rains in the world. Go on, fall back on words always already there, the precise spot available as in a fog that eyes burn. I carry your name away from our intersection. The poems no longer dissolves in a rhythm from inside my eye. What we just started to talk of, water seems to rise black and insistent, boats take off, rights grow small. Talk is so difficult. Two pairs of eyes see two different initial questions to disappear. As in a dream, the body thinks against itself. As if nothing had started yet, energy of beginning pushes toward my life ahead somewhere. Interval difficult to close. No matter how I curve, the questions I live in are always too big. I am not talking about violent wind blows the mind empty, new beginnings, or our walking toward where our horizons for an instant overlap but where I could get into my story, the road catches up with itself, and I'll be where I haven't left. Actually, this, as if nothing had started yet, is hard to read at this point. <laughs> so, and now I want to jump to the middle and read something from Lawn of Excluded Middle. So, these are now prose poems, and uh, they have no titles, so they just go on. <coughs> Let me have a gulp of water. So, from Lawn of Excluded Middle. When I say I believe that women have a soul and that its substance contains two carbon rings, the picture in the foreground makes it difficult to find its application back where the corridors get lost in ritual sacrifice and hidden bleeding. But the four points of the compass are equal on the lawn of the excluded middle where full maturity of meaning takes time the way you eat a fish, morsel by morsel, off the bone. Something that can be held in the mouth deeply, like darkness by somebody blind, or the empty space that I place at the center of each poem to allow penetration. <coughs> 
Because I refuse to accept the opposition of night and day, I must pit other subtler periodic periodicities against the emptiness of being an adult. Their traces inside my body attempt precariously, like any sign, to produce understanding. But so nothing may come of that, the grass is growing. Can words play my parts and also find their own way to the house next door as rays converge and solve their differences? Or do notes follow because drawn to a conclusion? If we don't signal our love, reason will eat our heart out before it can admit its form of mere intention, and we won't know what has departed. I worried about the gap between expression and intent, afraid the world might see a fluorescent advertisement where I meant to show a face. Sincerity is no help once we admit to the lies we tell on nocturnal occasions, even in the solitude of our own heart, wishcraft, slanting the naked figure from need to seduce to fear of possession. Far better to cultivate the gap itself with its high grass for privacy and reference gone astray. Never mind that it's not philosophy, but raw electrons jumping from orbit to orbit to ready the pit for the orchestra, scrap meanings amplifying the succession of green perspectives, moist features, spasms on the lips. This is not thinking, you said, more what colors it like a smell entering our breath even to the seat of faith under the left nipple. Like the children I could have borne, shaping my body towards submission and subterfuge. It is possible, I admit it, to do physics in inches as well as in centimeters, but a concept is more than a convenience it takes you through earnest doorways to always the same kind of example. No chance of denser vegetation, of the cool shadow of furs extending this line of reasoning into the dark. My love was deep and therefore lasted only one second, unable to expand in more than one dimension at a time. The same way, deeper meaning may constrict a sentence right out of the language into an uneasiness with lakes and ponds. In language, nothing is hidden or our own. It's light indifferent to holes in the present or postulates beginning with ourselves. Still, you may travel alone and yet be accompanied by my good wishes. I wanted to settle down on a surface, a map perhaps, where my nearsightedness might help me see the facts. But grammar is deep. Even so it only describes, it submerges the mind in a maelstream without discernible bottom, the dimensions of possible swirling over the fixed edge of nothingness. Like looking into blue eyes all the way through to the blue sky without even a cloud bank or flock of birds to cling to. What are we searching behind the words, as if a body of information could not also bruise? It is the skeleton that holds on longest to its native land. <coughs> I badly wanted a story of my own, as if there were proof in spelling but what if my experience were the kind of snow that does not accumulate? A piling of instants that did not amount to a dimension. What if wandering within my own limits I came back naked with features too faint for the mirror, unequal to the demands of the night? 
In the long run, I could not deceive appearances. Days and nights were added without adding up. Nothing to recount in bed before called falling asleep. Even memory was not usable, a landscape hillocky with gravitation, but without monuments. It did not hold the eye, did not hinder its glide toward the horizon where the prose of the world gives way to the smooth functioning of fear. If the wheel so barely touches the ground, the speed must be enormous. I knew that true or false is irrelevant in the pursuit of knowledge, which must find its own ways to avoid falling as it moves toward horizons of light. We can't hope to prove gravity from the fact that it tallies with the fall of an apple when the nature of tallying is what Eve Spite called into question. My progress was slowed down by your hand touching, by your hand brushing against my breast, just as travel along the optic nerve breaks the rush of light. But then light does not take place, not even in bed. It is like the kind of language that vanishes into communication, as you might into my desire for you. It takes attention focused on the fullness of shadow to give light a body that weighs on the, weighs on the horizon, so without denting its indifference. Finally, I came to prefer the risk of falling to the arrogance of solid ground and placed myself on the thin line of translation balancing precariously between body harness to slowness and categories of electric charge whizzing across fields nobody could stand on. Working the charge against my retina into the cognate, rain, cognate red of a geranium, I wondered if the direction of translation should be into, a, into arithmetic or back into my native silence. Or was this a question of right and left, reversible? And could it be resolved on the non-standard model of androgyny, sharing out the sensitive zones among the contenders? Meanwhile, everyday language is using all its vigor to keep the apple in the habit of falling, so the curve of the world no longer fits our flat feet and matters become too porous to place them on. And the last uh, sequence I would like to read is from um, Driven to Abstraction and is called Time Ravel. Not travel, ravel. <laughs> <laughs> so time ravel. With the mind's eye, we see against the light. The way we see the dead. My father reading at his desk. Read. Road, door. Remains unclear how my brain chose to store this image rather than another, or how it veers toward the surface. Ulysses fights his way back to an Ithaca with four lane highways, where serfdom has been replaced by alienation anomie, anxiety, returns, reverts, replies, a borrowed book, the sword to its scabbard, in recompense, response. The assumption is that the sirens have drowned in the alphabet and been replaced by warnings, war, 
warp. My father stopped reading to watch a magpie rising black and white against the sky. Memories are many, glitter in the brain ready to be pilfered. Does this fit my image of the real? Where the norms of social interaction have multiplied and spontaneous acts come back as mistakes or combustion? Natural feeling, temperament, disposition, impulse, energy, all lashed fast to the mast. The rubrics of the dictionary meaning business. Columbus's crew were afraid they would not come back, unable to close the loop time won't permit, but sometimes a ghost or shifting winds or the memory of a big slab of ice that a man with leather mittens splits across the middle to reveal the time hidden within where I might not find my body for the cold. And though my mother wraps the slab in a rag before putting it in the icebox, it would not warm me enough to have a self. Same, identical, Interest, confidence, esteem, reliance, respect. Skin, though it takes pains to remember caresses, is marked by the roads that pain takes. Color of fables, the Indies, scarves, curves, every island Columbus found was a vow kept for the map with no elsewhere. High spirits and cloud theory reflect in the sea and stitch coordinates toward a flight of gulls or stairs. America becomes a continent while numbers pass through the air and soar out of bounds or run from danger, flicker of fear. How can I remember my parents if I need to run my hands over my body to make sure it is there? or lean forward to brace against our element, deflect its head-on force into a more general time, where God of for love of us wears clothes. I can't hear my father's voice, moored as if among antibodies, articulation hindered by head hanging down and spill of oceans, spell, Sperm, spatter, splash. If the mechanisms of subjectivity are disturbed, it requires total restructuring of the world. As when I first learned that the earth turns on its axis, that spleen, noun, is a highly vascular ductless gland which serves to produce certain changes in the blood, merriment, obsolete, caprice, spite, anger, malice, moroseness, melancholy. Most marked in complex civilizations where the pace of events and cordless voices exceeds all the running one can do to just stay in one place. So silver on clear days is the light. Names multiplied in the wake of caravels, clippers, communicating vessels. The spelling capricious sea spleen as the winds. Track itineraries, track vanished and erased, track how many pages between Circe's island and Charybdis. It is not that our sensations need to match images in the brain, but that the brain needs a body for frame of reference no matter if it be square or canned, short, squat, parts fitted together to enclose a window, door, picture, or disposition of the mind. Just as emotion shows if we are ready for the future, hovering at the edge of our eye. Great 
Beginnings, too, can end up a small world, world, old. Set sail on the power of imagination for hearsay geographies and real dangers, with greed a secret motor. It drove them back home to cities crazy for spices and gold, in between waves and more waves. When I think of my mother, I get heavy in the pelvis for the children she wanted and begin to sing a complex song of if and so I never had a voice to introduce an exclamation, condition, stipulation, untenable argument or wish on condition, in the event that, allowing that these long-term memories are abstractions, a different mode of thought from short-term ones, and that their differences shape my sense of time. A violet's blue as a sign of distance. Thank you very much. Keith Waldrop was born in Emporia, Kansas, in 1932. His books include the trilogy, The Locality Principle, The Silhouette of the Bridge, and Semiramis, if I remember, as well as The Real Subject, Transcendental Studies, a trilogy which received a National Book Award, and Selected Poems, just out from Omnidon Press. Siglio Press, Press published a book of his collages, Several Gravities, in 2009. Waldrop has translated Baudelaire's Paris Spleen and Flowers of Evil, as well as books by several contemporary French poets. In 2000, he was named Chevalier des Arts et des Lettres for his lifetime contribution to French literature. He lives in Providence. Keith Waldrop's earliest poems present a charming eye who may in fact have something in common with the author. For instance, he stares at paintings so hard he feels he is about to consume them. And elsewhere he notes, my life seems to be turning out as predicted a small provincial museum, the kind that might have in some corner or other one work you could be interested in if you knew it was there. There's a lot invested in this I. In conversion, the poet informs us that, quote, Keith means wind, according to what to name the baby. <laughs> There's an almost Ed Dorn-like directness to some of these early poems, even to the use of humor as a means of documentation, of family, of neighborhood. Two reports is a stunning apostrophe to the poet's deceased father. His poems get a lot denser, yet simultaneously expansive. The eye persists, as in the long poem Elegy, published in 1983. I live on the surface in a world not yet evolved, he writes. And elsewhere in the same poem, hardly anything matters to me now but work. The restraint of his poem, The Ruins of Providence, is almost unparalleled. And yet, the perceptible world surrounds this eye, takes on more importance in the poems. The eye does not disappear, it is more surrounded. In plurality of worlds from transcendental studies, all is present, even as it becomes distant. Things become, things become animate, grammar remains. And in these poems, the poet allows us to see existence as if without filters. Please help me welcome Keith Waldrop. Hello.
I'll read from uh, several poems from a book called Potential Random. Uh, the, the poems don't necessarily have anything to do with each other, but, but they were all there at the right time, and so I put them together. Uh, and in, uh, I found a, uh, an epigraph to put on them from the work of Immanuel Kant. He says, I don't know, I don't know where in his place he says this, but I, I know I read it there somewhere. In deep sleep, the mind may come closest to performing rational thought. We have no reason for asserting the opposite except that when we awake, we do not remember our ideas. Uh, I, I read these uh, mainly because they all have the same title. Potential Random. <clears throat> A light Settle down, make a stop, linger. The alighting of birds. Through a pace, through a place, pass, dance, wandering women, rebel, unstable. Pinched off from a piece of clay, a kind of earth or soil, weakness, rejection, asphalt in the third millennium, unconscious recipient of memory, Hulking for Noah's Ark, the basket in which Moses was placed, and the Nile, dependent on water, solemn, set up camp. Watch me disappear. Unafraid, filled with terror, fat, shelter, rest, be quiet. Potential random. Many books have been destroyed, carelessly or by design, lost, burnt, forgotten, volumes drop out of existence, along with, more easily disposed of, proofs never pulled, unpublished manuscripts, notes for books, places and proposals for things to be written, collected, put into books. The number of projects unaccomplished in history must be enormous. <laughs> and much larger, almost infinite, the realm of projects unattempted, never started what no one ever thought to try. My doctrine would derive not from wisdom concealed by, by anxious arhats in caves beneath impassable Himalayas, nor from a chain of unwritten instruction past guru eyes down centuries. It would remain in a world beneath notice, too obvious to be considered. Thus, 
secret. The world, as it lies open, here, waiting for me to fail. I do not need to know your real name. This much seems obvious that as we move along the path, slowly but certainly, the path replaces us. And also, just as strands in the vitreous humor cloud the visual field, words stray, making our thoughts opaque. Potential random. Ship is in danger. Ship must be repaired. But ship must continue afloat as long as we continue crossing the dangerous waters. These events take place in order that they may be represented. Egypt is memory. Captivity in Egypt is memory. Ship of the north with its anchor from the south. It rides above the Ur fish. For many names for God come many gods. If you believe in any, you may know how the body could be glorified. And if you will rise with that withered arm, names of things can never enter heaven. Turn now. Together with your body, turn past the five windows, past your pride in the dark image and your body turning. Waking, doomsday for some dream. Words perish like the word for oyster. Words are a great retreat. They are like strips of existing or like seashells echoing words. Potential random. A view of the landscape Up, a view of the river, of bathers along the bank, down. Now a view of the view, a sheer perspective, charmed. He is sent away, so begins to exist. Strange. Homeward bound taxi. Rather hazy idea. Top or truth. Surely he'll find something to say on the silliness of opera. Bottom or beauty? Potential random. Stand here where without too great a turn my eyes meet your eyes mirrored 
and my eyes in the mirror, your eyes. Whatever through either side of us runs out of the frame and is lost. What's behind us is lost behind us. Reduced to picture, we can appreciate, appreciate our picture, reversed but right side up. Our lines of sight are straightforward, the surface glassy, clear, simple and astonishing, the location of bodies, grandly irregular, in a smooth surrounding echo. Potential random. Wicked at first, tore their clothes, refusing to speak, took off their sandals, I know not what. Fasted, ready by tomorrow, gashed themselves exactly at midnight, freely lamented. I know not whither. Wept. Potential random. What is seen then as the center is not the center, but only light feeding into the center. Devastation, ritual of covenant accompanied by darkness. Wash your clothes, shave off your hair, Bathe yourself in water. All space becomes neutral. Uncalked and unprovisioned, we reach shore. Something must be done about darkness before we can live in this light. Cold air and warm air tinkle the starlight. Nobody's mother tongue. Potential random. At the mouth of the stream, there is a mysterious island. A mountain on the island. The trees there bear no tree of life, precious stones, a place of desires. I crouch down in my torn clothes, blood-stained cloak. I cut off my hair and howl, slain man wallowing in his blood. They are so terrified, they forget to call for mourners. The other side of death. They mourn with astonishing frequency. A razor from beyond the Euphrates. She saunters under quick green trees, angels falling around her, chinks in the rational, song turns into lamentation, canopy of darkness. Soldiers offer strawberry coral, edola. The dark is slippery, shapeless logs, sacred stones, then images.
potential random. The shapes of things rise up against me. Cube, pyramid, cone, actual, ideal, and threaten to trip me up, obstruct me, box me in. They lie in wait. They spring from my own eyes. I take them all, straight lined or curved, reducing each to a circle, close each circle by a movement of my hand. Potential random. No counting the number of the dead, the number of those who will die. Kant thought Earth had at one time, like Saturn, a ring. Composed of watery vapors, it encircled the world in beauty to be regarded and appreciated by Earth's inhabitants. In the course of time, from the action of a comet or other cause, the waters composing the ring were loosed and fell upon earth, and in that deluge, the greater part of a sinful mankind perished. Lost thereby for the survivors, which is to say for us, the sight of that ring in the upper air the most exquisite view from the surface, surface of paradise or a young planet, our rainbow, a faint reminder of the glory lost. At the center of every system is a flaming body. Bright sun between grapevine and fig tree. By coincidence, sun and moon are exactly the same size. Celestial phenomena, there are so many stars merge along my line of sight. Directly before my eye descends uh, a spider, slowly, a ways away, just down to eye level. Earth spins in the sun's corona. High countries in the, in the dust and also elephants, alas. A hundred miles of umbra over uncounted acres of tundra. I try to find some sense in which behind is not in back of. It suggests the idea of a bird. Monstrous colors on certain things. Monstrous things in uncertain colors. One has to choose between life and what life contains. Sunspots freeze in place. Traveling some current, the road imponderable. Wastrel and hangman Thrive in the conquered city. What have I ever wanted to say but how at this moment? Potential random. He walks in darkness sits in darkness, dwells, 
darkness falls, clouds, covers, or clouds of insects, or extinguishing a lamp. After so many years, it ought to be infinite, but it never is, and car lights glide so easily across his ceiling. Neither cornlands nor well-kept vineyards only. He cannot decide whether it's better to be better to regard the soul as asleep or to take what seems like dream to be the waking world. Scattered objects must have something to tell. Between the stars, between the positive particles, there is said to be nothing. Can he hold this? Delicate arms, bare, a hopeless gesture. He cannot decide if cosmic fire creates the universe or ignites his executioner. The bitten line is broken, resembling lightning in a mediocre sky. He cannot decide whether it is a friend in a dream speaking to him of danger or a dangerous dream instructing him to act for the sake of the hypnotist. His face darkens with the darkness of delight. He dreams a costume dream. What colors are latent in his darkness? He does know that there are other shadows, uncertainties, headlights, fires on the beach at Nice, the horror of being chosen. At moments, life is so transparent that everything seems real, seems anyway familiar, distantly, like the aging face of someone he last saw young. He cannot tell if his dream, so quickly forgotten, roused this storm in his soul, or if anxiety springs from his being awake, alert, dreamless. Sallow throng beside dismal pool. A very high and concave roof. He cannot decide where reason ends, associating as he does darkness with creation. Between now and now, was time, will time be empty? What runs in the dark? Or in daylight from stone to stone, sudden a spasm, a streak of blood? Sheer throb relaxes into the mirror opposite hard to follow, complex but quite complete. Losing certain colors might impoverish his visual life, but he realizes that a flaw in the numerical system would weaken the structure of the world. With sunrise comes battle. How is it Sensitive to signs of the times, he finds it so hard to decipher headlines. And in what body would he like to be raised? He is no more present to himself than objects in his view. The journey long for so short a life, promising agate, Chalcedony, he attends to, ex to changing expression, flickers of shadow, 
to keep his thought from running inward to inward light. He cannot decide whether to change the subject. He sings English and understands it is not always possible to make clear distinctions. Sees no cause he to do no otherwise. He considers movement, perhaps in a sense of change, honing the sword. He cannot decide whether to describe his death in terms of hunger and sundown or like a newborn babe in the course of its disaster. There have been some more overwhelmed than he with shame, with pity and terror. The east ablaze, the city's spires of fire. He cannot decide if the experiment is local, all life composed on this periphery, or if along the wall of stars there's by chance another creature farther than faintest signals signifying Now a warm wind, wind riffles the leaves, ransacks the neighborhood. You will not wake up for me. In a certain chord by the western loop of Ermine Street, tomorrow is well known. Speckling as it does, flagstone and flag, slim white hands. The street ripples, roars. Take it all away, lay it among the scarcely remembered. As we stroll, a thick crust underfoot and perfectly firm, beautiful eyes and teeth flashing. Moss may edge the brook, tree shaded, street sleep, shadow damaged under a late sun. Snakes hate summer and are revived by rain. Housetops glitter a long-forgotten flame, a frightful dream, but do not ever dream of ghosts. They will undo your remembering. Latin shades, lace curtains, rich tumuli, the stillest city swarms with hurry, our restless fingers, so they stand. Throbbing silence, darkening room. Irrelevant, my own attire, blood-stained and ragged. What nightmare sleeping or awake, prying a bolted scuttle. Otherwise, no signal for fear. No sickness, no seasickness in heaven. Reality, Aristotle says, is not a daytime serial. Then comes love's army disemboweled, love's own cavalry, guts hanging from the saddle, adventures on my pillow and below the snow line. A fierce pride blazes at any hint of earthly pleasure. Thank you.